Hello and good afternoon, composition students. Uh, this is now week five, <clears throat> and uh, I didn't assign any homework last week, so you don't have to worry about that. I do want to give you some feedback about the first two assignments that were given. Uh, so I've printed off a few samples because I can't, there's not enough time to go over things individually with you, but if you do, have any particular questions after I finish this lecture and you watch it this week, then please send me an email and I will try and uh, answer your questions. And if uh, there's more than a few students that send me an email about the same question, then I'll address that in a future lecture so that everybody can get the answer. And we've got to be, we have to be sort of uh, an economy of communication here because it's really difficult to keep up with all this recording, lecturing, website updating, uh, Zoom communications and scheduling and so on. So uh, let's talk about the supporting argument assignment that we did first. So this was just a pretty simple discussion question. Is it better to have a student a high school student, uh, is it better to have a part-time job as a high school student or not, okay? And uh, this, this was, some students did way more than I expected, and some students did much less. So I want to give you an example of uh, a student, and I'm not going to use any names here. I haven't asked permission, actually, to talk about anybody's homework, so I'm just going to mention the the good things and the the weak points and the strong points about each one now the first one here it really doesn't have very many weak points it's very well done it's very thorough the student did about three pages i'll just read you the first answer just to give you an idea of what i'm looking for um, i don't want you to be caught surprised on the exam and be like professor you gave me you know a hundred percent on my homework yes I'm giving all of you credit for your homework because you did it. Because part of learning how to write is just practice. So I'm not giving grades on these assignments. Everybody who did it uh, and did enough uh, that I think they deserve the credit gets 100%. And if you sort of did an, it was incomplete, but you did some of it, you get half. And if you didn't do it, you get zero. Pretty straightforward, okay? But on uh, graded assignments, like the next one I'm gonna give you for homework is going to be um, what, what I call a response paper. I want you to write a full page about something, a topic. I'm going to give you a grade, right? You're going to, it's gonna be submitted the same way, but I'm going to give you a, I have to give a number. So if you get an A, it's gonna be a 90. If you get a B, it's gonna be an 80. And, and so on, 90 to 100 for an A, and and so on, all the way down the line, okay? And we'll talk about that at the end of class. First of all, let's just talk about the homework. So this is, this is excellent. This is something that would get an A if it was graded. Uh, question, the first question A on page five was, uh, high school students should have part-time jobs. <clears throat> Almost all Korean high school students don't have part-time jobs because most parents do not want their children to have part-time jobs. They think that their children can't focus on their studies or homework or do their best if they do part-time jobs. And without parents' permission, minors can't do them. Also, teachers' or students' perceptions about work in a school where children do part-time jobs are not good. If one student does work, other students and teachers think that they are not sincere. They also think that he or she is a student who worries about only now, not about the real tasks of future and life. The other's perceptions of the student give an effect to the student. Then he or she feels bad because he or she, and you can just stick with one or the other. It doesn't matter. If you're a girl, if you're a woman, go ahead and say she. If you're a man, you can say he, or just choose one or go back and forth. You don't have to say he or she each time. That's not necessary. Or you can use the plural. You can say they. Um, they worry about what people think about them and stop looking for part-time jobs. The student chooses 
the choices which are not his, but other people's. The stare that others cast is quite an important reason for children to decide something because teenagers are more influenced by others than other, by others than people of other age. Some students might want to have part-time jobs, but they are frustrated by other people, even if they have the capability to do study and work. That is excellent. That's a freshman, by the way. So, well done. Um, the main problem is grammar. There's some grammar mistakes there. It's not necessary to use both pronouns every time, but that is excellent. Just the, the uh, analysis there, you know, that, that a student, even if they wanted to, the usual response to this question is, parents don't want it, teachers don't want it. You know, it, it uh, sort of takes away, it's time lost from studying, right? Time working is, as I said, it's a zero sum thing. Increased time working as a part-time job is a decrease in time. Now I can argue against this um, much better if I argue against that and say, listen, uh, I don't feel like studying Korean after I've been teaching English all day because it's a similar activity. You can study all you want, but you burn out and you can't keep reading books, but you can stand there like a zombie and you can um, deal with customers. And it's a totally different activity. So sometimes that's not true, that it's a zero sum thing. However, this student actually argued another thing that it's not just about the time spent or the student's capability of balancing these two activities. It's also the fact that other people are going to look at them as if they're not treating school, not prioritizing school. This student said that they're not sincere, which means that the society is judging them as being, well, wow, this person really doesn't want to go to Seoul National University because they're at the 7-Eleven trying to make a little bit of money when the future is way more important. This is a, this is a very thorough argument and you, it takes a lot of, it would take me a lot of effort to counter all these points. Um, this is very well done. This is what I want. It's exactly what I want. So do it like that. <clears throat> and on the exam, if you write an answer like that, that's full marks, okay? The student also um, mentions university students, should they have part-time jobs? I'm not gonna read you the whole answer, but there's another excellent answer there. Also, personally, the student has worked at Patty Baguette, uh, Patty Baguette excuse me, for one month and felt the satisfaction of doing that. Um, the person, this student didn't meet new people or friends before having worked there, but now um, I can meet new people, my boss, manager, other part-timers and customers and talk with them. I'm able to get energy or encouragement from them. Also, I can get achievement when I earn uh, money for myself. It is a reward for my effort. It makes me gratified. Part-time jobs also make, make uh, us grow into society and we can learn real life skills by doing that. So I recommend university students to do part-time jobs. So there's a personal element in the second answer too, followed by uh, a table that says the percentage of part-time jobs done by university students. 20% um, in the first year, um, close to 40 in the second year, and then back down to around 30 in, the, in the second year, and then closer to 10% in the fourth year. So the student has even provided a graph with some information. The second year of, of university is the most popular for doing part-time jobs. Not surprising, because first year you adjust, second year you need money, third year you need money, fourth year you're looking for a new job, right? Fourth year you, you stop your part-time job because then you're, you're preparing for interviews and looking for a real job. A part-time job is a real job, just a, a one that's more, pays you more and can support you completely. Part-time jobs support you part-time. Full-time jobs support you full-time, or they should. That's the way they're supposed to work. So this excellent, excellent homework done by the student. It's got several other, uh, it's got s several other things supporting the work, including a, uh, a table that um, talks about uh, minimum wage as well. Uh, you'd have to 
compare minimum wage to cost of living if you really wanted to use that data properly. But the first, the, the really good question that was left at the end of this homework is, I learned that I must write down a source when I use a diagram or table quotation from other people in high school. And I think it's the same when I write in English, but I don't know how to do it or how to write a source down when I write in English. Help me, professor. Okay. Uh, yes, this has to be dealt with. So it's not easy to do this, to explain it exactly on the video lecture. So I'm just gonna upload a file to the website, okay? Um, I'll put it on the website and I'll put it on the Cyber Campus too, since now I know how to use the Cyber Campus also. Uh, just a guide on how to do it. But basically, I just want you to write at the end of any assignment, you need to write references, okay? So wherever you put the table or wherever you put the quotation at the end, you put in brackets, you put the name of the author or the sort. What if there's no author, it's a, maybe it's the title of the website or some indication of where that comes from. And then in the reference section, you write, if it's a website, you have to put down the website address and the author and the date that you accessed it, right? And if you got it from a book, then, and it's written by somebody, then you write the author's name first, the title of the book, the year it was published, uh, and the publisher, okay? It's pretty straightforward. Uh, I'll put a little, you know, guide, a link or um, a file for you to look at so you know how to do it exactly. Uh, when you're doing assignments like this, just the reference and the link for the website is fine. When you do your papers, there's a format you have to follow, okay? So we'll talk about this again at the end of the, the lecture here. Anyway, um, excellent work by student, we'll just call this student X, okay? You know who you are, I'm sure. All right. Um, <clears throat> there, here's another one that was really well done about the supporting, the supporting argument assignment was really, really good. Um, some, some of them were longer. This is the kind of length that you, the student I just read, they actually did more than I expect, but um, that was a freshman actually, so very impressive. This is a student who was, um, student number is older, so I'm assuming maybe a junior or senior. Um, let's just choose one. And th this is what I'm expecting, sort of as a minimum, this is what I'm expecting, but this is well done too. It's, it's quite concise. And there's a, enough detail and support there um, for the person to still get an A. Um, the other student really went above and beyond. That is higher than for freshman level there, what I normally expect. Uh, so let's just do D, part-time jobs pay a good salary. In Korea, part-time jobs pay a small salary. Part-time jobs pay commonly the minimum wage, and it's hard to support yourself as a student to pay for university tuition and the cost of living. You must work on weekdays and weekends. You must work every day. Also, part-time jobs don't have vacations, so students don't have enough time to study and their grades go down. It's hard to do both. They must choose between part-time jobs and studying. If students could concentrate in, on their own studies, they could get a scholarship from the university or the government as an alternative. That's well argued. Uh, the points are all there that's on topic. That's good too. It's shorter. Uh, it doesn't have as much information. It doesn't have any, any tables in it, but it is also um, homework well done. It's an assignment well done. Okay? So those are two examples of uh, homework done well. Now, uh, the next part was page 9 and 10, uh, and it's um, A to F. Now, this homework... It's a little bit tougher, but it's just as important, okay? I think, um, I shouldn't say it's just as important. It is, on the exam, it's going to be very important, as I told you. I think the supporting argument thing, if you did wrote like that, if you wrote like those two students, you're going to write well for your assignments, um, your graded papers that I'm going to assign to you. You're gonna do well on those and you're gonna do well on the exam. So that's the most important thing. The second most important thing is this. 
um, paragraph analysis. Can you recognize what's wrong with a paragraph? Because like I said, this is going to help you analyze your own paragraphs. So it's got like a kind of, dare I say, synergy effect. No, I shouldn't say that. I, I'm getting sick of that word. We use it too much. It um, has two benefits. It benefits you criticizing other people's work and it improves your own work by helping you analyze and criticize your own stuff, okay? So people sometimes find this really hard and they just don't know what to say. But the other problem is choosing the wrong thing. There are particular things that are wrong with these paragraphs. Not only do you have to write the details and, and explain to me what's wrong with it, you have to know that this is the thing that's wrong with it, not something else, right? Okay, so I'm gonna look at these things in parallel. When I need a good place to study, I go to the library. It's always quiet there. This is A. Excuse me, I'll start again. This is 11A. When I need a good place to study, I go to the library. It's always quiet there, so I can concentrate. It's easy to find the books I need, and I can search for information on the internet because there are several computers. The other people in the library are also reading or working, so the mood is good for studying. I study better and faster in the library than any other place. Okay. This paragraph is weak because I think this is one of the responses. This paragraph is weak because I think that sentence, it's easy to find the books I need and I can search for information on the internet because there are several computers, um, is not related to the paragraph and the topic. This paragraph is talking about a library for study. I think that that sentence should be removed. Well, this is an old book, so I can see how you would think that you don't need to use, you don't need to go to the library to use the internet. I think this is a good point. You have to say that though, okay? Because that's really what the point is. Otherwise it's fine, right? The half of the sentence is outdated. That's a problem, but really that's not the main problem with this paragraph. This, this paragraph is short on detail, definitely, right? There, it's not specific. One of the problems about it is it's just generally talking about a li library. So like if you wanted to make this paragraph, I don't think it's a weak paragraph. It's okay, right? It's not fundamentally, uh, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with it, except for it's short on detail. It's very uh, non-specific. I would never get away with writing a paragraph at the university level. Um, you have to be more specific, okay? I want you to keep this in mind because technically in the book, they're going to say this paragraph is structurally okay, but it needs more support. It needs more specific information so that you can follow that. The, can, you, can, you can be persuaded, right? Some facts, some studies, some locations of libraries, some examples, anything. But this is just a general discussion of, you know, the mood in a library, which isn't great. Um, yes, this student did kind of notice that uh, you don't need to go to the library to use the internet, but that's not really the point, okay? That is, that is, if you wrote that and you said, the internet is, the library is in a place where you have to go for the internet, but you have to be specific in your criticism as well, okay? Next, B, I need to buy a motorcycle. With a motorcycle, I could get to my job more quickly. It takes two hours to get work by train. That's very slow. A motorcycle is much faster. If I had a motorcycle, I could save a lot of time. Taking the train is not fast enough for me. This paragraph is weak because uh, it's repetitive. Um, that's very slow and a motorcycle is much faster uh, is redundant. They're saying the same thing. Correct. Excellent. That's a good observation. So I should remove the, one of those sentences should be removed. <clears throat> um, they're both pretty bad. So you, making one more better complex sentence is better. That's very slow. A motorcycle is very faster. These are very short, simple sentences. This is a very weak paragraph. So this is only one problem. It repeats itself is one problem. So it's not concise. Second problem is the sentences are too short. We're gonna talk about this later in the book, but um, when you develop your language skills, you don't write sentences that have three words. 
That's not a good paragraph. Um, if you're speaking or there's a point that you need to make and you're making something really short for a reason, fine. But if you're writing an essay, nobody's writing three word sentences because it just doesn't give enough information to the reader. So the sentences are too short. Um, it's not concise, it's repetitive, and it goes off topic. Why are we talking about trains? I thought we were talking about the person needs to buy a motorcycle. Arguably, you can say there's no topic sentence either because you're talking about buying a motorcycle and then you're trying to justify it. And then the last sentence is, um, taking the train is not fast enough for me. Why are we taught? So the topic sentence should really be trains versus motorcycles or the... I think the, the main advantage over a motorcycle, or these are the advantages of motorcycles over trains. Everything's wrong with this, this set, uh, paragraph. You could write a whole paragraph. So this is why this um, assignment was not as well done as the first one. Nobody in either class got all of these things, right? This, this second paragraph is horrible. It doesn't have a matching topic sentence or concluding sentence. It goes off topic. Uh, it repeats itself. And the sentences are too, did I count four or five? Uh, it's a, that's a really bad paragraph. You could, I mean, I'm not gonna make a set, I'm not gonna make a paragraph that bad for you to look at. You're gonna have to find certain things, but this pretty much has everything wrong with it. It's too short. Uh, pick anything you want, but if you really wanted to answer this question right, if I was being really rigor rigorous, I would be expecting you to write down three at least, possibly to have a complete answer. You should write a whole paragraph about how bad this paragraph is. It actually takes longer to say how bad the paragraph it is than it takes to read it. That's how bad it is, okay? so. Um, anyway, this student was correct. That's one of the problems with that paragraph, but there are others. Um, the third paragraph is almost as bad. <clears throat> First, insert a blank CD into the computer. Then select the song list that you want to copy. You will see a button that says, click here to burn. Click on that button, then just wait a few minutes. That's all. See, we need to update these because nobody burns CDs anymore. That's something that we did in the early 2000s and late 1990s. I'm barely a millennial because I was born in 1981. So in high school and university, I burned CDs all the time. Legally, of course, wink, wink. And um, this is instructions on how to do it. You may not know how to do this because nobody does it anymore. You have USBs. We have, we have USBs. We all have USBs and smartphones that have way more storage. But way back in the day, a CD that had 500 megabytes storage on it used to be the thing that we used. 700 megabytes, 500 megabytes, there were different, uh, but anyway, that was a lot of storage. Now, my USB that's stuck, this tiny USB that's stuck in my computer, I think it's 32 gigabytes. That would have taken me um, 64 CDs. So I would have gone to the store and bought a spindle of like, a hundred CDs and then spent all day burning the data to get the same amount as my little stick. Anyway, I'm going off topic a little bit, guilty. This does not go off topic. It's concise, it stays on topic, so it's coherent. There's no topic sentence. It's just a list of instructions. This paragraph is incomplete, right? We don't have a topic. It just starts with first. So it's, it's a process paragraph. It's telling you, do this, do this, do this, and then you're done. That's not a concluding sentence though. You can't just say that's all. That's only two words. It's not even a real sentence, okay? So this one's awful too. It's definitely on topic and it's concise, but it doesn't give you any information. We don't know why we're talking about this. Why are you telling me how to burn a CD? We, we don't do that anymore. I can, um, blow the dust off my CDs that I still have in my desk because I haven't thrown them out. I haven't used them uh, since I came to Korea, which was more than 10 years ago. So this basically, this paragraph is obsolete. Okay, I'm not gonna go through all of them because it's gonna take too much time, but you get the idea. 
we're looking for particular things. It has to have the elements, right? It has to have the topic sentence, the concluding sentence. Uh, it has to have detail and support. It has to stay on topic, right? It can't deviate in a major way from the main topic at the beginning. Uh, if it doesn't, if it's not long enough, then it's incomplete, okay? It has to be concise and it shouldn't repeat. That's the one that the student caught in B, which is very good. You don't want repetition and you don't want to go off topic. But these paragraphs, all of these paragraphs are really short on, they're not specific enough, any of them. You can make that criticism on all of them, that it's short on detail. So it's not as persuasive as giving specific examples, proving things by using facts and statistics and evidence. There's, there's, we always say that the burden of proof is, is on the, the person making the argument, right? So you are, when you write your paper, you are making the argument. So if you want to prove something, you got to give a certain amount of information. Otherwise, um, the person will not be convinced. Okay, it took a long time to go over that. <clears throat> so I am going to now, we'll just say we've finally completely left um, chapter one behind. But really, the reason we're still on chapter one and we're going into the second month is because chapter one is essential. It, those two homework assignments, if you did them well, excellent. If you um, were, or if there's things you can improve, please think about them and listen to what I said this lecture and try and um, adjust, try to to add them to your writing. Like I said, it's easy for me to say, be coherent, concise, uh, and clear. And, and until we have examples, it's hard to see exactly how that is. Now you have examples. Now you've had homework. Now you've gotten my feedback. So you should be able to apply these things to your own writing. Even if it wasn't your writing that I read today, you should be able to do it, okay? So two weeks from now, I would like you to hand in, okay? So two weeks from now means I'm gonna have I'm gonna have the the Monday class and the and the Friday class hand them in on the same day because we're kind of doing things in sync. So this just makes sense, I think. So this week's Friday is April 2nd, okay, which is Good Friday, and Easter is this weekend. Next Friday, the week after this Friday, April 9th. That's when I want you to hand this in. The Monday class and the Friday class. We'll have everybody handed in the same day, okay? So April 9th is the due date for this assignment. I want you to write one page, one full page. Um, I will upload a little um, exam format example to show you the the type font, no bigger than 12 point font, okay? Don't make it six point font either because I won't be able to see it. Um, 10 or 12 point font, please. And uh, double spaced, which means one space between each line. Uh, this is just for, I don't usually print them out anymore and use um, a pen like I normally would pre-COVID, but Still, it's just neat and easy to read when the lines are separated a little bit. Um, so most of the students who did well on these assignments are doing that already. You don't have to double space on an assignment where you know it's a short paragraph and then it's A, B, C. You don't have to. But on this, this graded response paper, please do, okay? So I want you to write about um, giving and receiving gifts. That's the title of the chapter, okay? So there is a, a paragraph which is way too short at the bottom. It's called a birthday gift, right? And it describes a birthday gift. So I just want you to choose something memorable, a gift that is memorable. And I want you to, to describe the gift itself, the situation in which the gift was given or received, right? And then I want you to analyze what the gift meant, why it's memorable, okay? In this uh, birthday gift sample paragraph, uh, I won't read it because of time constraints, but if you read it, 
there's only there's only seven sentences. I'm looking for a whole page. So yours yours should be at least 20 sentences. All right. Now they say, the person says, they provide a, a definition of a good gift. The, a gift should be personal and thoughtful. And it doesn't have to be related to um, being um, expensive or sophisticated. They use the word fancy. Okay, so it doesn't have to be stylish, high class, or cool, right? It has to be personal and thoughtful, all right? So I'm going to say you provide your own definition of why the gift is important to you, okay? So it should be memorable in some way, but it could be memorable, unlike this example, it could be something you remember because it, it was really expensive or because of who gave it to you or because of the, the emotion of the moment or because you still have it, right? A lot of my gifts, uh, you know, that many of my gifts, I don't have them with me. Um, this, this cross I have here, this gold cross, um, is I wear around my neck. That might be my first choice if I was just asked, you know, tell me about a gift that uh, is memorable to you. I might choose this gold cross because I know, I can remember without asking anybody or looking up the information or thinking about it, it was my 16th birthday and it was given to me by my mother, right? My family is Christian and it was given to me by my mother and the association I have with it is not religious. It reminds me of my mother. I carry it with me and I have uh, only taken it, taken it off to play sports. Otherwise, I've worn it continuously for 24 years, right? There's no other gift I have like that. People have given me nice jackets, which I've loved, and people have given me various things, shoes, um, toys. Uh, people have given me things, consumables, like alcohol or other things. Those have been, uh, I can remember them. They've There have been some really nice gifts, but all of them are... Uh, either in storage in my house or gone. I lost some of them. I consumed some of them. The, the only one that I have with me all the time, the only gift, the oldest one, and the one that I carry with me all the time is the one around my neck. Okay, so this, this is my argument that this is why this is the most precious gift to me. Okay, you can use a totally different argument. It can be something that is gone but you remember that gift and you remember that moment. I actually don't remember the moment that I got this gold cross. I can I just remember, I just have it with me. So it reminds me. So maybe I don't want to choose that. Maybe that's not the most memorable because I can't actually remember receiving it. Uh, so I can change my criteria, right? So let's say my favorite gift is the one I can remember, um, I usually tell this story. I'm still I'm running short on time. Anyway, bear with me for a minute. Christmas uh, is the most fun holiday in Canada. So every Christmas, all the kids get excited, and uh, you know, it, the anticipation builds and builds, and it's like everybody's birthday at the same time. Okay. So I used to be really excited, and I'd make a wish list, and I'd write down what I wanted. My parents would would choose some some of the th items on the list and get it. For me for Christmas. Now my mother just sent me a photo um, coincidentally a couple weeks ago of her and I sitting on the floor um, and me smiling with this big smile on my face with uh, this Lego spread out all over the floor building this you know Lego space vehicle. Um, but I've already been telling this story for years to students in relation to this specific uh, assignment because what I remember is about two weeks before Christmas I couldn't take the suspense and I knew that in my parents room in the closet that they had hidden they had gone Christmas shopping already and the presents were hidden in there so I wasn't allowed to go in there I wasn't allowed in my parents room in general I don't know if that was the rule in your house but in my house the kids were not allowed to go in my parents' room. We just That was their personal space. So I never went in there for any reason except 
this one, <laughs> I wanted to find my president, see if she had gotten that Lego space vehicle I wanted. So when she was busy doing something like laundry in another part of the house, I ran in there and I looked around and I found it. So I was super excited, but there were still two weeks until Christmas. So it actually turned into a form of torture because I knew it was there, but I couldn't tell anybody that I knew, especially my mother, and I couldn't grab it and open it. I, I had to just try and be patient. And actually that's one of the things I have trouble with. Um, I'm not a very patient person. So this two week wait, keeping it inside was a horrible experience. It was not a horrible experience. I just couldn't sleep. I wasn't, it wasn't horrible. I am exaggerating. It was a difficult experience. It wasn't nearly as fun as, you know, being excited and not knowing. So on Christmas morning, when everybody opened the presents and took pictures, I was like, yay. And then I was uh, relieved. It was, it was kind of a fake smile. Now I don't have a picture of that. There's no picture of me actually tearing it open. And I can't see whether it was a fake smile or, or anything, but that's what I remember. Um, but my mom actually sent me a photograph of maybe one hour later when I'm just enjoying and I'm really happy. But what I remember of, from that gift was the lesson that you don't need to, surprises are great. You don't need to find out what you're gonna get before um, because it ruins the experience of, of tearing, tearing, like you wrap things for birthdays, you cover them so you can't see what's inside. If you know what's inside, what's the point of wrapping it, right? So since then, anybody who has asked me what I want for my birthday, unless it's somebody, you know, who doesn't know me well, and then I say, oh, well, I, I need some new shoes, you know, sometimes my aunts or uncles or, or somebody i don't, I'm not that close to ask me for something. If they, I need something, I'm just like, you know, a sweatshirt, some socks, whatever, something useful. But if it's somebody close to me, somebody, uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, brother, sister, mother, father, they ask me what I want. I say, surprise me. And that's because of that gift. Okay. So that's what I'm looking for. Explain to me why a certain gift is, was precious to you. The memory of it is the thing that you need to focus on. Um, the impression it made on you is what I, I want you to explain, okay? Describe the present, the situation, and then explain how it made an impression on you. And that's the assignment due on April 9th, okay? So that's it for this week. I didn't get into chapter two, but we will. And uh, you'll get, we'll talk about all of chapter two before your paper is due, because that will probably help you um, look over your paper and make sure it's done properly for when you hand it in. That is all. Thank you everybody for listening. And um, this lecture will be uploaded, I think, onto the internet um, today, Sunday, and available to you through the Cyber Campus by Tuesday. Remember, we're still going Tuesday to Monday, so you have to log in through the Cyber Campus. Don't just watch on YouTube exclusively. Uh, you can, but you still have to put in the time so that, that you get credit for your attendance. I have to emphasize that, okay? Just watching, going directly to YouTube uh, will not give you uh, attendance credit. So make sure you watch it through the Cyber Campus during the Tuesday to Monday window. Don't forget that, okay? Have a great day and see you again next week.